علي محمد ما شاء الله لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم حسبنا الله ونعم الوكيل نعم المولى ونعم النصير بشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي الحمد لله رب العالمين الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب قلوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا وشفيع ذنوبنا ومولانا بالقاسم محمد والصلاة والسلام على أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المنتجبين المنتخبين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا ورحمة الله على أحبابهم وأصحابهم وشيعتهم ومواليهم أجمعين واللعنة الدائمة على أعدائهم وظالميهم ملعونين من يوم عداوتهم وظلمهم إلى قيام يوم الدين وبعد يوم الدين أما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في كتابه المجيد وفرقانه الحميد وقوله الحق وهو أصدق القائلين أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إنما يتقبل الله من المتقين صلوا على محمد وآل محمد Once again in a much louder voice The topic of discussion has been the story of Habil and Qabil and the lessons that we can learn from it. Truly when we come to understand Quran, the more we think about it, the more we come to know that the knowledge in fact is unlimited. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed this book it's a true ni'mah for Muslimin and humanity. When you try to ponder into one ayah and think about what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us in any ayah, if you truly think about it, you can never come to a certain conclusion that now the tafsir of this ayah is complete. No. When you relate to it, uh, when, you, when you think about the matalib and the topics discussed in the ayah, it takes you into the depth that you have never known all your life. The same reason that even 
after having 10 or 11 lectures planned regarding the same ayah, it turns out that even the 10 and 11 lectures are not enough to explain this one simple ayah of Quran in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala encourages his Habib Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad wa ajjil farajhum to narrate the story of Habil and Qabil the message clearly is the message of sacrifice sacrifice is something why do we need to do sacrifice to prove our loyalty, sincerity, khulus, iman, faith to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not know who we are? Does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not know what is in our hearts? Does He not know what we will do in the future? We have the knowledge of what we are doing right now but if I ask you what were you doing yesterday at 3 o'clock in the afternoon you will not be able to account for the activities that you did around that time and you will not be able to place a certain activity with a certain slot of time you cannot remember it properly all you can say is I think I was this is all you can say but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what you were exactly doing at that time if I ask you what will you be doing tomorrow at 3 o'clock in the afternoon all you can say that this is the plan but I don't know what exactly will happen but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows exactly what will happen so when he asks us to sacrifice for him, show our loyalty to him, show our sincerity to him, huh? show our faith. This is not to prove anything to him. This is to prove to us. Whatever we are on the inside, to prove that that inner condition of us, <clears throat> our spiritual existence, to prove that state of spiritual existence, we have to go through this exercise. So we do not blame Allah for what will happen on the day of judgment. Read aloud salawat. So he always asks for sacrifice. He always tests his people, people who claim that they are close to him, people who claim that they love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He will always test them. He will always test them. We see Nabi Ibrahim, so many tests in his life and he passed each and every one of those tests not a single word in Quran in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks to Nabi Ibrahim in a stern way. No. Whenever he talks about him, Allahun, Halimun, huh? gave him three titles, Khalim, Imam, Khalifa. He is a Nabi, he is an Imam, and he is a Khalil. Three titles. You see the stories of many Anbiya, but the way Ibrahim has passed the test and shows, showed his true Tawheed in his heart, we can never find anywhere. Being thrown into the fire, Jibreel comes quickly. Do you need any help? So whose help? My help? No, I don't need your help. And whose help do you need? Only Allah can help me and only I hope only from Allah. My hopes are directed only towards Allah. 
even Jibreel, even his help is no good. Where is he going? He's going into the fire. Will it take ages to get to the fire? No. In a few seconds, he will land there. And this is the discussion that he has in the way with Jibreel. Whose help do you want? I want Allah's help. Okay then, do you want me to take the message from you to Allah? Asking him that your Khalil is asking for help? He says, no. So why? He knows. If he wants me to die, then I am satisfied with his decision. If he wants me to live, then he will save me. If he wants me to live, he will save me. If he wants me to die, why would I do, want to do anything else? Pass, passes the exam. Then comes to his son Ismail. I saw in my dream, Anni adbahuka fandur madha tara that I am slaughtering you, sacrificing you. What is your opinion? What does Nabi Ismail say? What does he say? Adhwasu ahlam. Oh, don't worry about the dreams. This is just dreams. No. He knows that this is his father and he is Ulul Azm <coughs> Nabi. Ulul Azm Rasul. So, he says, whatever Allah has said, you do. Fan. Setajiduni, insha'Allah. You will always find me amongst the Sabirin. Ya abatifal ma tu'mar. Whatever have you, uh, you have been instructed, do it. Ismail already knows that this was the order from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is Nabi Ismail for you. Then he gets tested when he has to leave Hajira and Ismail in the desert. Hmm? The wife of Nabi Ibrahim, Sarah, she says, take Hajra and Ismail away from me. Now we shouldn't say that Sarah was being unfair and oh no. This is the plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nabi Ibrahim who wouldn't yield even in front of Jibra'il. Do you think he would give up in front of his wife? No, this is not, he doesn't follow his wife. He follows the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sarah was just an excuse. That's it. This is the order of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How do we know that? When we read the story, we see that when Nabi Ibrahim is taking Hajra and Ismail with him, whenever he sees a good place with greenery and trees, hmm? it's Palestine. Palestine is a very at that time, it was a very green and very fruitful area. Hmm? Whenever he sees uh, a nice garden, a nice place, hmm? population, it's okay. Should I drop them here? Jibril says, no. Allah says, keep walking. Next town, should I drop them here? No, keep walking. The way he asks Jibreel at every stop, it can clearly tell us that he was not following the orders of Allah. He was following the orders of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He takes and takes coming to the mountains of Allah Akbar. The mount is the heat, sand, there is no water, no greenery. Huh? No sign of life. When he reaches there, okay. 
leave them here. Jibreel says, leave them here. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, leave them here. Does he tell Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, please, please, can I choose a place where they can actually survive? No. What does he say? Nothing. He leaves Hajra and Ismail there and he starts walking back. He gets on his ride, he gets, starts coming back. On his way back, Rabbi inni askantu min dhurriyati biwadin ghayri dhi zar'in inda baytika al-muharram Oh Allah, I am leaving my, some of my family, min dhurriyati, some of my family in a land that has no life a barren land in the Baytik al Muharram near your Baytul Muharram. The foundations of Baytullah were still there because it was initially made by whom? Nabi Adam. From that time, the foundations were, could still be seen. In the Baytik al Muharram. Why? Rabbana liyuqeem al salat. Rabbana, O oh Lord, for only for one purpose, so they can offer prayers for you. Liyuqeem al salat, to offer prayers for you. So now we understand why Nabi Ibrahim left Hajra and Ismail in this barren land. That's not a domestic issue. It is the test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to show humility to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to show sincerity towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to show Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that whatever I do in this world, I want to do khalisatan li wajhillah. Khalisatan li wajhillah. Whatever Allah says, one should do. Whatever He stops you from doing, you should refrain. What does Quran say? وَمَا أَتَاكُمُ الرَّسُولُ فَخُذُوهُ وَمَا نَهَاكُمْ عَنْهُ فَانْتَهُ Today I will be just brief in my speech, just a little message and I have to finish uh, the speech early today because they have uh, uh, a longer program afterwards. So just a few more sentences and I will just start the musibah. وَمَا أَتَاكُمُ الرَّسُولُ فَخُذُوهُ وَمَا نَهَاكُمْ عَنْهُ فَانْتَهُ Whatever Rasul gives you, take it. Whatever he stops you from, stay away, refrain. We see Ali ibn Abi Talib in his life, he would walk behind Rasulullah. He says himself, I would walk behind Rasulullah like a child of a camel walks behind his mother. Rasul would take a step, then Ali would take a step. Rasul would stop, Ali would stop. Hmm? The loyalty, the wafa, the sincerity towards Rasulullah, trying to protect Rasulullah. Every time putting himself in front of Rasulullah to save him. In every ghazwa, we see that Ali ibn Abi Talib is next to Rasulullah trying to protect him. He doesn't care about his life. The mission of his life is to do whatever Rasulullah wants done. If Rasulullah says go, he goes. If, if Rasulullah says stay, he stays. The night Rasulullah migrated to Medina, he told Ali ibn Abi Talib, Ali, I want you to do something. So what? Can you sleep in my bed? This is something that is very hard for a person who knows that if I sleep in this bed, I will be killed by the enemies because they are after Rasulullah. But Ali ibn Abi Talib is worried about a completely different thing. He is worried that if I let Rasulullah go alone, who will protect Rasulullah? So he asks a question, if I sleep on your bed, will you be safe? 
Allah. If I sleep in your bed, will you be safe? Rasulullah says, yes. When Rasulullah says, yes, does Ali ibn Abi Talib say, how can I believe you? Prove it. Does he say that? No. He says, okay. You said, and I believe you. He sleeps. Allahu Akbar Ali ibn Abi Talib, who was qa'im al-layl, qa'im al-nahar, who never slept a whole night in his life. Part of night he would sleep and he would stay awake for the rest of the night and do ibadat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Says that I slept that night. The sleep of that night is the best night of my life. Hmm? This is him putting himself in front of Rasulullah, saving. And we have a term of waqf. To devote yourself just for Rasulullah. To give away yourself just for Rasulullah. This is what we need in our life. We have the teachings of Ahlul Bayt والسلام, We have teaching the teachings of Rasulullah and Aimmatul Huda and Sayyida Fatimatul Zahra Salamullahi Alayha. We have these teachings with us. We know that these are true. All we need to do is follow them. We don't do that. We don't even want to read them. We can't find time to read them. We can't find time to plan our life in such a way that we can follow the instructions of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salatu wasalam as to how one should spend his life. Instead, we let the system guide us through our lives, the machine of life. No matter where you are in the world, there is a machine that you are put into and uh, you keep circulating, circulating, circulating in that particular machine and at the end when you are of no good, you are being, you are thrown away like a useless spare part. Please read aloud salawat. Now we see that in the life of Imam al Hussein, Abu al Fadl al Abbas is doing the same. Imam Ali had one of his many of his ashab he said something about Malik Ashtar Malik Ashtar would be just like this like Rasulullah like Ali ibn Abi Talib would walk with Rasulullah and help him in every way Malik Ashtar would help Ali ibn Abi Talib in that way Imam writes a letter to people of Misr, Egypt and tell them I'm sending to you as a governor my one of my trusted ones Malik ibn Harithin al Ashtar obey him for he does not take a step forward unless I say so and does not take a step backward unless I allow him he does not show haste where he needs to be patient, where I tell him to be patient, and he is not patient where I order him to be hasty. Follow him. These words of Amir al Mu'mineen, Allahu Akbar, we all can claim that we love Amir al Mu'mineen, but no one here can say for sure that Amir al Mu'mineen loves me. And here Amir al Mu'mineen shows such great love for his Sahib Malik Ashtar. Says Malik, Wama Adra Kamal Malik. 
Malik, and what would you know who Malik was? Wallahi, law kana jabalan la kana fanda. If he was ever a mountain, he would be the strongest, most tallest of the mountains. Hardest, immovable. Walau kana hajaran la kana salda. And he, if he were, a, if he was a stone, he would have been a gem, the precious, the most precious of the gem. And then he says something that should move our hearts. He says, "Kana li kama kuntu li Rasulillahi sallallahu alaihi wa He was to me like I was to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wa Malik Ashtar has proven himself, his loyalty to Ali ibn Abi Talib, like Ali ibn Abi Talib proved his loyalty to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And similarly, in the same way, Ammar ibn Yasir, when his final moments come and he asks Amir al muminin do I have your permission to go and fight in Safin? Amir al-Mu'mineen says, stay. He doesn't want to let him go. Stay. He wants him to stay as long as he can. Just doesn't want to lose him. He knows he's, if he goes, he's not going to come back. He knows if he goes, Amir al-Mu'mineen will not see him alive again. He asks again, a few moments later he asks again, do I have your permission? Halli min ruhsa. Do I have your permission? Can I go and fight now? He says, stay. A few moments later, he asks again. I mean, Amir al says, stay. The fourth time when he asks, Amir al looks at him, tears rolling down on his cheeks. He takes Ammar ibn Yasir in his arms and he says something that one can only imagine to achieve in his life. He says, Ni'mal akh wa sahibu ant. Such a great brother and companion you were. Amir al Mu'mineen is saying that. He's my brother, and he's showing love. Cries for Ammar ibn Yas. Cries. Don't we see the same in Karbala? Imam Hussein says he 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 takes pride in the fact that the the number of loyal companions. The way he has had, no other Imam has had those companions like that. So this is why when we come to the night of Ashura, inshallah it will be tomorrow night, we will see if we can explain some of the stories of the night of Ashura. But there is one thing that I would like to say that when Amir al muminin says na, to his Ashab and the youth of Bani Hashim, he says, it is still night time. I am taking my bay'ah off from your necks, you are free to go. Each and every one of you is free to go. Go save your lives. Go and save your lives. Each and every one of you, leave. Take one of my children. Hold hands. One of my children with you, take them away as well. Every one of you, 
while leaving, take one of mine with you as well. Go. They want me, they don't want you. All his ashab present there, the narration say that not a single person left. Not a single person left. And the first one to reply to Imam al Hussein is Abbas, Abu al Fadl al Abbas. He says, Wali manafal dhalik, O Imam, why should we leave you? Linabqa ba'dak to survive after you. La aran Allah dhalik abada. May Allah never show us the day where we have to live after you, O oh, Abba Abdullah. <laughs> 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 On the day of Ashur. Say, venerate that Abbas Abu Fadl al Abbas was attached to Imam al Hussein like a shadow is attached to a person. Whenever he went to pick up a body of a companion, Abbas would be with him. Abbas was with Hussein when he brought back her. Abbas was with Hussein when he brought back Muslim ibn Awzajah, Zuhair ibn al Qail, Habib ibn Mazahir, Aoun ibn Muhammad, when he brought back Ali ibn al Akbar, Imam puts his cheek to the cheek. When he's saying على الدنيا بعد الكلام يا بني Abbas stands there. He has to watch his brother Hussein in such a pain. He never leaves the sight of Imam Al Hussein till the end. He never leaves the sight. No. <laughs> the time comes when everyone is gone. Ali Akbar is gone. All his brothers are gone. The Qasim is gone. All the companions are gone. Imam is sitting, his head down. Abba, sallallahu alayhi ayyuh al-abd al-salih. He comes out all ready for the battle. Imam al Hussein, Sayyidi. Halli min ruqsa. Do I have your permission to go and fight? Imam looks at him. Why do you want to go? And the Sahib Liwahi. commander of my army, how can I let you go? <laughs> <laughs> 
Just at that time, a group of children comes to Imam al Hussein. They have empty, <laughs> empty cups in their hands. Al Azash, Al Azash, asking Imam al Hussein to get us one drop of water. The thirst is killing us. The Imam tells Abul Fadl al Abbas, go talk to these Ashqiya. See if they can give some water. Abul Fadl al Abbas goes, asks for water. Shimr says, La'een. Shimr says. Al Abbas, go tell Hussein. If the whole earth, the face of earth was filled with water and we had control over it, we would not let Hussein have one drop of water. Not unless he pledges his allegiance to Yazid. Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas replies, he says, this is my Imam, this is my Sayyid, this is the grandson of Rasulullah, you want him to follow Yazid, you want him to follow the Lu'ana, that will never happen. He comes back, tells Imam Hussein, this is the reply that he gives. Imam throws his head down and starts crying and weeping. They say that the collar and the shirt of Imam was wet with his tears. I thought about that. Why would Imam cry? This is not an act of a mujahid. Why would he cry? The only reason that came to my mind, it broke my heart. <laughs> when Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas comes back and says, they are not giving me a single drop of water, oh, Imam. What are my orders? <laughs> Logically, next order would be oh, Abbas, oh, brother Abbas, go, go and see if you can forcefully bring some water to Khayyab. But how does Hussein tell Abbas to go to picks up the bottle of water, he takes it with him, he gets on the horse, he leaves, he charges, there are 4,000 soldiers on Farad, he attacks them and breaks their formation. He gets to Farad, he enters Farad, he's standing in the water, he fills up the bottle. Then there is one person in the army of Yazid who is watching Abbas. No one has the audacity to come near Abbas. He says that I was watching Abbas from a distance. He did something very strange. He bent down. Into the water, he puts his hand in the water, collects some water, yeah, and he says, bring 
brings it closer to his mouth. I do not know after doing this without drinking a single drop of water. Why would he throw it away? He says, I was just thinking about that when I heard a voice. There is nothing for you but humiliation after Hussein. Oh, you shall never live after Hussein. Hussein Sharib al Manuni. See, watch Hussein. Do you not see Hussein? From the morning of Ashur till the Asr of Ashur, he has been continuously facing death, drinking the elixir of death. وأنت شا وأنت تشربين وتشربين بارد المعين. And you have the intentions of drinking cold water of Faraya. Get out of water. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. There is a bottle on his right arm. All his gham is to get the water to Khayyab. Ya Allah, this time he takes a different route through the trees. He goes, tries to save the bottle. Tries to save the bottle, he goes. He's charging, he's going fast as he can. All of a sudden, one of the Ashqiya hiding behind a tree attacks him from behind. The right arm is gone. With his left hand, he holds the bottle, puts his in left arm, saying, if you pray, if you cut my right up, even if you have cut my right up, inni yuhami abadan an dini. I will always protect my deen. I will always support my true imam. He's walking. He's running. The horse is running. And then someone attacks. The left arm is gone. Quickly he holds the lace of the bottle in his mouth. Imagine, everyone is trying to puncture the bottle and it's Abbas who has no arm. How do you hold the sword when you have no arm? How do you protect the bottle with a shield when you have no arm? All you can do is put the bottle on the back of the horse and bend down on top of it, protecting it, making yourself a shield so no arrow or a spear can puncture the bottle. Everyone is trying to puncture the bottle. All the arrows coming. Abbas takes them on his body. Whoever has the arrow strikes him with the arrow. Whoever has the spear strikes him with the spear. Whoever has a stone, he hits him with
to the children. How can I now go back to Qiyam? What will I say to Sakina? What will I say to the children? What will I say to Zainab? What will I say to my brother Hussein? He doesn't leave his position on the horse. There is one person to take him down, he has a maze in his hand. He attacks him with the maze on his head. This head is so hard that he cannot hold himself on the back of the world. He falls down, brothers and sisters, after him falling down, even though he and many arrows and spears on his body. But the Ashqiya do not stop attacking him. Whoever has the sword hits him with the sword. Whoever has the spear hits him with the spear. All oh, Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas can say, Alayka minni salam, ya Abba. Thank <laughs> you. 